can I introduce Manny Kirchner, who's going to be our speaker tonight, who's basically going to introduce himself. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Can everyone hear me all right? Can everyone hear me okay? That should be better. There we go. Right. <laughs> Right, hello everybody. Firstly, thank you so much for appearing. It's a, it's a rather large amount of you. I'm a bit scared, but I will. We'll, we'll carry on. We'll carry on. <laughs> I'm sort of expecting my parents and a few other people, but uh, <laughs> apparently this is interesting. So there we are. Um, yes. So a brief introduction to myself. Um, I'm here uh, with the Rockley History Network and Archive. We're a local history group. We do all sorts, um, and yeah, we're very grateful to have you here today. Um, firstly, thanks so much to them for organising this. I've been abroad until very recently, and after that I decided to have a kidney infection. So I've been even less busy. <laughs> Sorry, even more busy. Um, and uh, yeah, and another great thanks to my amazing girlfriend, Anna, who's recording this for, uh, for YouTube as well, so for posterity. But anyway, big thanks to them. Yes, briefly about me. Um, I uh, was originally local, uh, lived in Four Marks, but uh, have moved abroad since then to study. But uh, as I'm sure we were all, I was very bored during COVID, had a lot of spare time on my hands, uh, ignoring my A-levels, bunking off my lectures as much as possible, going on walks. And uh, I found rubbish on the fields. I found old rubbish. I found broken pots. I found flints. And uh, as, as any sane person would do, I'm sure, I asked where, you know, what are these things, where the hell do they come from, what do they mean? And uh, as any sane person would, they would start to study archaeology right after that, so that's what I decided to do. Um, so after some years of getting really muddy on a field, uh, <laughs> getting a detector out and doing a lot of research, I thought I'd uh, come back to the community and tell you a bit about what I found out, a bit about my research. Um, and to, put, to use a very pompous title, I'll tell you about the archaeology of Rockley, or this is some archaeology of Rockley. Anyway, um, we'll start off in the Stone Age. So we're very fortunate enough in Rockley to have a lot from the Stone Age. Um, the oldest archaeology comes from the oldest part of the Stone Age, the Paleolithic, the Paleo meaning old, the old Stone Age. Um, in fact, thanks to the lovely Mr. Carr here, um, <laughs> we've just managed to, uh, to acquire the newest and the second uh, Paleolithic find. In fact, this is the very oldest find from Rockley, the very oldest human find from Rockley, known as the Chicken Kiev, for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and this is the second of very few finds from this very ancient period. And in fact, this is so old, this wasn't made by humans. This wasn't made by Homo sapiens. This was made by Neanderthals, so our cousins who have long since died out, very long time ago. So we'll, you can look at that later, but don't, well, maybe you can touch it. So you'll see how I feel. Um, after the Paleolithic, we have the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age. Um, from this period, we have a lot more we can talk about. Um, we have uh, small stone blades, flint blades. Uh, you can see some of those later. We have a variety of tools. Um, what does this tell us about the local community? Well, we don't have settlement. We don't have settlement until much later in the Neolithic. What we have here is uh, local communities following uh, animal herds, basically. And they, they migrate on a, on a seasonal basis, so they might be following other trends. And humans are basically following those. We're hunter-gatherers, right? We're hunting uh, uh, deer and other animals such as that at this time. So we don't have any permanent settlement. We don't have a lot of archaeology, but we have some small things um, that suggest uh, woodworking, meat working, and things like that. After the Mesolithic, we have the Neolithic, the New Stone Age. Um, and this is where we see a real boom in the archaeology and a real boom in what's going on in Ropley. Um, at this period, we have the dawn of agriculture. Um, which might sound quite boring, but it's really fascinating, actually, because uh, we have a massive boom in technology, really. We have people who stop following these herds of animals and being quite nomadic to sitting down and saying, right, this is my landscape, and they start to control it in that regard. They're cutting down trees, they're managing forests, they're planting and sowing crops, um, and then they're staying for most of the year and then reaping that. And we have finds even from this period from four marks, uh, a sickle, that suggests we have this reaping of uh, crops, which is absolutely fascinating. From one find, we can tell all that information. We don't have any houses. We don't have any human bones from this period, but we have a sickle, which tells us all that information that we know people have been living here and reaping these crops. Here we have a map that I've compiled from all of my muddy adventures. Um, this is a topographic map, so all the undulations of the landscape. Um, and the light gray and dots are small numbers of finds or individual finds, and then the darker it gets. So for example, this dark gray and then this black here, shows large numbers of finds. Um, 
This is concentrated around all these little wiggly lines that you can see here, and these are dried up river valleys. Um, and that's right, Ropley back then actually had rivers and streams. It wasn't just a dry nothing in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it was quite attractive. <laughs> so here, this is a pond here, which is still a spring, but not a very good one, um, and fed these river valleys. In fact, this goes up to Alton, both of these, and this goes down to the Solent. In fact, this is the, the watershed between the Solent and the Thames. Um, yes, the Solent and the Thames, yeah, I did get that right. Um, exactly. So the landscape looked incredibly different back then. We, we can't be so naive to say it looked exactly like this and we just had some cavemen running around. So what sort of finds do we find, do we have from this period, do I find? Well, we have scrapers. We've got a lot of scrapers on the table. I'll show you those later. Uh, these would have been used not just for scraping animal hides to get a nice clean surface on one side, uh, but also used for woodworking um, or for food in general. And then picks, we've got some picks as well. These would have been used for mining flint. Some hand axes, again, the chicken Kiev, uh, which have been used primarily for butchering. Adzes for hollowing out wood. Imagine a pickaxe, basically. Borers used for drilling, bone, wood, leather, and so on. And then blades, which would have been used to harvest crops. So I've used modern technology to, uh, to generate an, uh, an artificial image here, which is why you shouldn't look too closely, because it makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> don't know what this is. Um, <laughs> but here we have a river body. So this is one of these streams that have long since dried up and quite a wooden landscape. And we, here we have a Neanderthal. I've decided this is the Paleolithic, so I'm, I'm sure that's what the AI was trying to do here. Um, and we have a Neanderthal washing something or other. It looks like a small church, but um, I'm <laughs> probably, probably isn't. <laughs> washing, I don't know, perhaps some nuts or some rather dirty berries. <laughs> um, so here we go, what, what conclusions can we draw about this period? Well, we have these many source streams running through the village. We have a far more wooded landscape than we do today, and obviously very sparsely settled in the Neolithic and not settled at all prior to that. And the, the natural fauna, the animals here would be animals like red deer, badgers, and trouts, obviously from the rivers. Now we move on to the Bronze Age. Um, I've used my very primitive uh, computer drawing skills here, slightly better than the artificial intelligence. To, uh, to draw a landscape image of what the Bronze Age might have looked like at this period. I've been a bit, uh, been a bit kind to myself in adding some roundhouses, which we have absolutely no evidence of, but I'm sure they existed. <laughs> uh, what can we see here exactly? Well, we can see a chieftain or a chieftainess. I've left the gender there up for question because we can't always be sure that they were male or female chieftains at this time. They're wielding the infamous Laiway talk, the Ropley talk, I'll get onto that in a bit, and a large sword and a lice, a very pretty cloak, uh, jewellery piece there, yeah. And then we have, I've decided to show this little man um, who is managing the woodland, because that's quite important for the Bronze Age. We have great wooden management. Oh, and some burial mounds, some barrows, some tumuli, which I'll speak about now. So archaeology isn't just getting muddy in the field, it's also spending absolutely hours on Google Earth. Um, and sometimes when you're Google Earth, you find little squiggles, and these squiggles make you happy as an archaeologist. <laughs> this rather round squiggle here is a barrow from the air, and this is another barrow, uh, even though this one looks rather disappointing. And here's a map, again, using this topography. Now, the red dots here are barrows. Unfortunately, only one or two have been officially mapped and recognised. The others, um, some other local archaeologists have found out. Um, and the blue Diamonds are finds, but don't let this confuse you. There's not necessarily a concentration here. It's just there's been a lot of detectoring and a lot of field walking going on over here, not so much over here. Um, so let me just show those barrows again. There we go. So what kind of barrows do we have in Ropley? Well, barrows come in different shapes and sizes. Um, we have bowl barrows and ring barrows primarily in Ropley. A ring barrow would have been surrounded by a ring ditch. This is in profile. So if you can imagine, we've cut the earth down. And from the air, this would look like a big ring, which is what we saw in the previous picture. And then we have bowl barrows as well, which looks like an upside down bowl. And inside, you can see this little brown splodge, which is the beaker in which cremated human remains would have been interred. And in fact, we know these barrows have been here for so long, they've even gone into the old Ropley history books um, in 1922. And these crop marks form through different, uh, well, human, <laughs> human uh, ways. Sorry, brain fart. Um, and for example, we have these different colorations, these different maturities of crop, which form these crop marks due to root systems, basically. So if we have a ditch, we can have a far more developed 
soil, far more developed hummus um, to form, allowing roots to grow more deeply and then mature, therefore quicker. And this can either turn up as a, a greener crop, depending on the season, it can turn up as a greener crop, so a darker color, which we have here, or later in the season, it can turn gold, it can mature quicker, so we can have maybe a lighter ring. And then in the bank, the inverse happens. We have shorter roots, crops are stunted or might even die, which is what we have here in the middle where we would have had a mound. So that's just a brief introduction to how crop marks fall. What are some of the finds from Ropley? Well, like I say, we've been blessed in that regard. Uh, these are some axe head finds, uh, Bronze Age axe heads, and a whole gorgeous uh, flat axe head has been found as well. Perhaps not gorgeous to you, but to an archeologist it really is. Um, and here we go, here's this very flat axe head in this man's hand, and he's chopping down a tree with it. Um, just to say something quickly to bronze finds, um, we can think of uh, these technological epochs, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, a bit like smartphones. Um, if you think about the beginning of the smartphone period, which we're in now, I suppose, you can say the smartphone age. <laughs> um, the beginning of this in the late 2000s, uh, smartphones existed, but not everyone had them. They were incredibly expensive. They were rare, if you will, um, and they were status symbols. And you have this with these technologies as well. Bronze was like this, iron was like this. It certainly existed and the technology was known in the early period, but it wasn't until much later when it became more widespread and everyone had access to it. It's not like one day some Neolithic farmer woke up and was like, right, I'm gonna become a Bronze Age chap now, where's my bronze? No, it was, it was a uh, dissemination of information, basically, and knowledge. So these ax heads aren't very early, they're, they're much later into the Bronze Age. And that's why we also have flint finds from this period, and we'll look at some of those later. Now on to possibly the most important archaeological find, or arguably the most important thing ever to come out of Ropley. <laughs> and that's uh, the Lyway Gold Talk, which was ploughed up by accident in 1845 by Mr. Lillywhite. Um, somehow over the years it ended up in Cornwall, uh, still there now, thankfully on display, not gathering dust. Um, and the, the Lyway Gold Talk is really spectacular. Um, it's really quite big. There's a replica in Alton, if any of you have ever been to the Curtis Museum. Uh, the replica stretches from my forearm to about my arm. It's, it's really quite big. And uh, if you think about how expensive and fanciful and uh, how luxurious gold is today, and imagine walking around with a massive gold arm bangled these days, imagine doing the same in the, the Bronze Age, you know, where metalworking as a whole had only just really been discovered. Um, this find is absolutely spectacular, um, and it's incredibly well preserved, so much so that it's often used as a, uh, a textbook example. So here we've gone back to our chieftain, or chieftainess, and uh, I've put some of these finds, these Bronze Age finds, onto this person to see what this incredibly high-ranking chieftain might have looked like. So here we have the Lyway Gold Talk on their forearm, a golden ring, and then this lovely dirk, this big sword, and a nice little hair ring. Now I've been very, uh, very kind to myself, I've been quite uh, <laughs> relaxed, and given themselves uh, a, uh, a pin, a, uh, a cloak pin, which unfortunately was not found in Ropley, but I'm sure you can forgive <laughs> that it was found in Colmore, the neighbouring parish. <laughs> and here we have some examples of finds. So there's that sword blade I was talking about. And here are those flint tools I'm mentioning as well. Bronze Age flint tools are very recognisable, that they're perhaps not as high quality um, and uh, tend to be different in size as well, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger. It's not always easy to have a rule of thumb in that regard. And uh, some lovely gold jewellery. Now moving on to the Iron Age. Here I've had another go. Um, this one may be slightly better at uh, uh, imaging what, uh, reconstructing what Iron Age Ropley might have looked like in one of the communities, as we'll come to see. Now this is a type of enclosure called a banjo enclosure. Yes, that's what they're actually called. I'll speak about that in a second. So again, to the air. This is what Iron Age settlement and activity looks like in Ropley. Here we have a rectangular pen. Possibly an animal pen might also have been a settlement enclosure, but possibly only really for animals. And then here we've got a really big mess, and we'll talk about that later, but uh, there's a lot of Iron Age stuff going on in there as well. So now on to, I've already mentioned these banjo enclosures. Uh, what the hell is a banjo enclosure? Well, as the name suggests, it's, a, it's an enclosure that looks like a banjo. Uh, probably asking yourself, that doesn't really look like a banjo. Well, you're right, <laughs> it doesn't. Perhaps a squished banjo, squished banjo enclosures. Um, so here we go, I've traced over them. So here we go, here we can see what a really nice banjo enclosure should look like. So we've got a nice big body and then a nice long neck. And uh, yeah, well, that doesn't really look like a banjo, but we can ignore that. Um, the ones in Ropley are sort of squished and a bit deformed. Um, 
<laughs> it's just Ropley, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Ropley has that effect on people. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, here we have the entranceway, the large tailing enclosure. And here we have an annex. And this is where all the activity would have been. And here we have another example, but the Romans have been ever so rude and decided to put a big enclosure in the way, cutting off the old one. But uh, hey ho, that's the Romans. So here we have one, um, again, with all those details uh, highlighted again. We have a nice entrance, which would have been able to have been gated off and guarded quite well. And we have all these pits. These dots are all pits. Um, now, pits are really important in the Iron Age. Um, pits have many purposes. They could either be extractive, so you might want to extract clay or flint or gravel out of the soil for whatever you might want to use that for, be it make pottery, make, uh, make your walls, or uh, build in general. Or it might be used for waste, a bin of the time, as you can imagine. You put your, your animal bins in there, your broken pots and so on, even human remains sometimes. Um, or thirdly, and this is quite interestingly, uh, fridges. Uh, the Iron Age people obviously didn't have smeg fridges, so they used pits, smeg pits. Um, it, the soil tends to be quite cooler than above ground, so you can imagine that if you put a slab or some wood on top, you can keep things cooler and you can actually preserve them. So pits are multi-purpose uh, in this period at least. And here we have an annex closure, which you do get sometimes, but they're not always there. It doesn't have to be part of it. And this is, like I say, the internal zone, which is where all the activity is. And just to remind you, this is in Ropley. This is not too far away from where we are here, actually. And if you just keep that shape in mind and sort of twist it and turn it into your head, you can see that I've used it to make this image. So this is Ropley some 2,500 years ago. Uh, here we have James and his cattle, Bob. <laughs> I don't know and uh, going into their enclosure. And again, we don't necessarily have the evidence for these roundhouses in these positions, but I'm being slightly kind on myself. Um, then we have a pen here for some nice domesticated cattle. And we have a family, and we have probably a community of these. And again, this isn't the only one in Ropley. We've got two or three others, so we're not talking about just a farmstead in the middle of nowhere. We're talking about an interconnected, vibrant community where we've got a population of tens of people. Then the Romans come. Uh, I've got a nice Roman denarius here. I haven't been lucky enough to find a coin anywhere near as nice as this. Uh, hopefully that day will come, but we'll see about that. Yes, uh, Roman archaeology is quite tantalising in Ropley. Um, we don't have a villa, we don't have a site, and we don't know an awful lot. Uh, what we do know is we have a lot of finds, primarily found by detectorists. Um, Roman Ropley is really bustling with activity, but there's not necessarily one story that we can pin this all down to. What most likely the case is, uh, is several different farmsteads or hotspots of activity that uh, don't last for the whole duration of Roman occupation, but are just here for bits here and there. But one thing we can be for sure, uh, sure of, sorry, in Ropley are the Roman roads. Now, this is a bit speculative, but we certainly do have Roman roads in Ropley. Um, in fact, we have so many that a centuration type of grid system has been theorised by some archaeologists where I've, I've left them out, but we have uh, parallel running roads going like this. So we have roads going like this in this orientation and roads going like this in this orientation. Um, exactly, the centuration would be some sort of farming network. But again, I'm a bit critical of this. Um, we don't seem to have all the evidence of this um, and it doesn't seem to add up in certain areas. But we do have evidence of Roman roads for example, here, this has been excavated and this has been quite um, happily put down as a real Roman road. This one, through my own research, I've been quite happy to call a Roman road. And then some straight paths here. For example, Brislin's Lane seems to be quite a good contender and the A31 as well. Um, so we, we, have, we have definite activity, but obviously some speculation. Back to the air, or uh, the office chair in my case. <laughs> um, we have Roman roads that we can see on aerial photography. We have rectangular enclosures, and we even have possible religious sites. Now, some of you might recognize these round shapes. Um, that's because these are Bronze Age barrows, and what the Romans really like doing is appropriating prehistoric uh, religious sites, uh, or the religious sites before them, or the ritual sites, if you will. Um, on the one hand, they understood the connection that these people had before them to the environment, especially the Iron Age natives, um, but not always. Um, a lot of the time it is just you're on a high point, and the high points tend to have more you know, ritualistic and spiritualistic uh, connotations. And the Bronze Age people, as well as the Romans, as well as the Iron Age people, even the Middle Ages people, even today, people still put a lot of ritualistic weight on these high points. So we, we get that, this recycling, if you will, of religious sites. 
So that's what we see here, this enclosure, probably built by the Romans, possibly a temple on top. Again, quite speculative. Now here are just some of the very <laughs> tantalizing finds from Rockley. I'm sure a lot of you don't think this mucky old bit of pot is very tantalizing, but believe me, it is. Uh, <laughs> you're probably more interested in the gold ring. Um, but no, this uh, is quite fascinating actually, and I only found this out the other day, but it's an amphora handle uh, I was lucky enough to find. And it would have gone out a bit like this and gone out a bit like that, and it would have probably gone really large, probably like this. Sorry, not, not to scale, this is about the size of my finger, but uh, <laughs> it would have been quite a large pot where uh, wine would have been stored and then imported over here. Imported from where you ask? Probably Spain, uh, at least the pottery is from Spain. So um, we see Ropley importing and buying in goods from as far away as Spain in the, the Roman period. So that's something quite spectacular. Obviously, the, the gold ring is quite pretty. Um, that's about all I can say to that. Uh, and then a grot from me. Grots are ugly Roman coins for the uninitiated and a, a very nice silver coin. Again, I've left out the really good finds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now into the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, in history, we tend to have the, uh, the view that uh, everything is nice and cordoned and off and nice and cut up and separated. Like I said earlier, the, the Stone Age person woke up and decided to be Bronze Age and so on. But uh, in reality, we have a very slow change and we have these evolutions. And even in such tumultuous periods as the Anglo-Saxon period, where we really have a sort of political takeover and a lot of political instability for centuries, um, even there, it's very hard to say exactly where it cuts off. But either way, that aside, the anglo period Anglo-Saxon period starts around 450 when the Romans start to leave at least the governmental aspects of England behind. And uh, it's speculated, but Anglo-Saxon tribes, tribes from modern day Denmark, Denmark and Germany, are then asked in, uh, invited by local rulers to sort out the collapsing and crumbling kingdom. That's the speculation. Um, but this person, who we can see here, Robert, is very important for Ropley. Um, Robert's got a red beard and uh, this makes sense, and this then I will give context now, <laughs> uh, because Ropley itself is uh, an incredibly important uh, puzzle piece in the local story. Uh, Ropley comes from the Old English Ropper and Lee, meaning Rob's Lee. And Rob is short for Robert, and this old name Robert uh, comes from the Old English word Hrodbeot, which sounds like red beard, and that's because he was indeed, indeed red bearded. Um, so Ropley is indeed Robert's Lee, uh, the red-bearded man's Lee. And what is a Lee? Well, a Lee can be all sorts of things, but in this context we think it's a settlement, we think it's a woodland clearing. So here I've drawn Robert on his horse on his way to his woodland clearing where he settles with his family. So this is Mr. Ropley, if you will, some, who knows, 1,400 years ago. So that's the sort of things we can, we can learn and deduce from place names. And I'd argue place names are far more important than any Anglo-Saxon coin hoard that you might hear about or any fascinating Saxon this and that, because place names, just they describe the landscape in a way that you couldn't get from anything else, because they've been preserved and in such a great way, and I'll show you now. So these are all place names that we take for granted in Ropley. Ropley Dean, Harkham, Statley Lane, Gascoigne Lane, Lyway, Charwood. These are all just places we think about on a day-to-day -day basis with no second thought. But in reality, they hide fascinating details about the past. Ropley Dean was the valley, which quite obvious it's in the valley. Harkham, which is now, I mean, uh, just a, I think it's a stately home, it's quite a fancy house, but it's, it's just a house, it used to be a hamlet, it means the Valley of the Goats. Stapley Lane uh, is the woodland where posts are gathered. Uh, Gascoigne Lane, which is, has a very long story about, I don't know how they managed to get Gascoigne out of Gaston. In the 1800s, it was still known as Gaston, but uh, someone got their fingers on that and decided to rename it from the grassy enclosure. And Lyway, this farm, uh, just, uh, I think it's about a mile east of here means the way to the clearing and probably meant the way to Ropley, the way to the Ropley clearing, which is fascinating. And uh, Charwood, the peasant's wood. And these are just some examples of the really fascinating place names we have. And uh, for example, West Tisted. Tisted uh, derives from stead, meaning a farm place, uh, and uh, Tissa, which would have been a, a personal name. So that would have been Titcher's stead where he lived. And these place names really just hide so many fascinating details. And I've only picked a handful here, but I could really go on for hours about these amazing place names. And here I've used AI again. This one's slightly better, less confusing, to uh, show what this properly might have looked like some thousand and a bit years ago. 
So we have wooden huts, which have all since but rotted away. And we have our woodland clearing hidden in the big depths of this very thick forest. I'll talk about the forest in a bit. This isn't just any forest. And possibly an early shrine in the middle. I think that's, I think that's what the AI was going at here. Uh, maybe <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark type of shrine, but uh, <laughs> not, 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 it shouldn't be like that, but it looks like that. But yes, this, this thick, dense woodland isn't just any woodland. This is uh, Andrid's world. Andrid's world was a big, uh, primarily, I think, beech woodland that covered the southern eastern part of England from, uh, from around Kent to just about this part of Hampshire. And it grew and grew after the Romans evacuated, if you will, their English colony. Um, and it is preserved again in a number of place names where they talk about the woodland or the, the edge of the woodland or the clearing within the woodland. So again, we have this place name connection and it tells us so much about the landscape. But after the uh, Anglo-Saxon period, we have the Middle Ages. And I've picked here a very important coin. Well, not a very important, a very fascinating, a very nice coin. No, it doesn't say a lot. I don't know a lot about it. <laughs> but it was found in Ropley some years ago by detectorists. It's an angel. It's a very uh, fancy type of coin. It's about this big. So it's quite a big coin and it's solid gold. Um, and uh, the find of a lifetime. But uh, I just thought it's a pretty picture. I won't be talking about it anymore. <laughs> Here uh, is my attempt at a, at a map of medieval Ropley. Here I've used some uh, old names, some old place names, old spellings at least. So here we have Lie Way Farm, which would have been here, next to Charlwood. Charlwood. And then we have Ropley. This is the 15th century spelling of Ropley. And then we have Habakum down here. Ignore the windmill, that's a mistake. It shouldn't be there until 100 years later. Then we have South Street, then Gilbert Street. Then we have, instead of Bowers Grove, we have Boorers Grove. And then Rainscombe, North Street, and the Roll to Oatholm. And then the road to Pitters failed. Fancy ways of saying things. And then Kite Wode, which is now Kitwood. And Old Downwood was Doon Wode. There you go. And now to speak briefly of the wealthy of Ropley. Ropley hasn't always been a get, get away for the, the mega rich. <laughs> I don't know, if it still isn't, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, in the around 600s AD, Ropley was gifted to the Winchester bishopric. Not the whole village, or what, the majority of the village was likely gifted, but uh, some fields were allowed for the local peasantry and other landowners. By the 1100s, we have the wealthy Gervais family. Uh, we probably doesn't say a lot to you, but the Gervais family is probably the most famous or the most important, sorry, Ropley family of the, uh, the Middle Ages. They were lords of the manor for most of the period and they held the most land until the 1450s. In the 1200s, the Gilbert family is first recorded in Ropley, as well as the Budd family. The Budds and the Gilberts are a very old Ropley family. The Gilberts are last recorded in the 1800s, and I think we still have some Buds in the village, so the, the Budd family have been in the village for 800 years. Um, and uh, the Gilberts, of course, give uh, Gilbert Street its name, for example. And then in the early 1400s, Winchester College is founded by uh, William of Wickham. And he's also the Bishop of Winchester, so he gifts some of this, in fact, most of the bishopric land in Ropley to the college, which is why the college owns and owned and still owns a large amount of uh, Ropley. And he also took gifts from individuals, for example, the Gervais family. So they gifted or sold a lot of their land to the college. And in the 1450s, they're recorded for the last time in association with Ropley. They sold all their land, and they moved elsewhere. But an important note to make on the Gervais and Gilbert, Gilbert, Gilbert family are uh, that they are both uh, noble Norman uh, family names. So the Gervais family name, in fact, there was a, a, a number of uh, bishops of Exeter who were Gervais, and the Gilbert family is also a, uh, a French name. So it shows you the Normans came and conquered even here. And I really like my place names, I really like my lane names, so I thought we'd go back in the medieval period and look at some local names and talk about those briefly. So we have Court Lane, for example, and this was the lane that led to the Manor Court. So if you have a drive down Court Lane, you know that takes you straight to Manor Farm. That's because it took you to the Manor Court. Manor Farm itself uh, was the historical medieval Manor Farm until it was demolished and replaced in the 1700s by a more modern farm building. Gilbert Street, as I've already explained, is named after the Gilbert family. Gullet Wood, just outside Rockley in Byton, uh, is named after throats, after gullets, because it was a hanging ground. The same with Gibbet Copse in Shorten, if you're ever on the other side of Four Marks. There's a woodland there, which was also a hanging grounds. And then Webb Lane is named after the Webb family, who uh, are recorded here in the 1400s and onwards. And then Park Lane is named after Sutton Park, which uh, 
there's a bit of a mysterious park. It, it's not recorded all that much, but either way. And there we have Gilbert Street recorded for the first time in uh, around 1520, but this is a later copy. This is from 1640. And there we have Gilbert Street. Now on to the post-medieval period, the 1400s to the 1800s. And we have this rather nice description of Ropley from 1551. They described it as being a little village, a good mile from Sutton Church, the Lord of Sutton being chief lord there, having sundry fairer woods lying four or five miles together, and sundry places set of most with beech, which woods we came not in. I think Ropley hasn't changed that much since 1551. <laughs> I think a sundry little place with beech woodlands, there is, I can describe it any better. So it shows you how little this village has changed. Um, but we're very fortunate enough to have some of the first maps from this period. Um, now, this might not strike any of you as familiar where it might be. Any ideas? Audience participation, any ideas where this could be? <laughs> that's oriented, yep, yep, yep. So that's old north, that's, that's the north they had back then, but this is, this is now north. I've oriented it for, for, for modern audiences. No ideas? Okay. Well, this is just some bit to the east from here. The map's going to come in slowly. This is Lyway Lane to the east. We're here, roughly. This is Lyway Lane, just running in here. And this is Dogford Wood, which is still there 400 years later. This map is from 16, no, sorry, yeah, 1678. And here we have Lyway Farm in the middle. And the fields are still just as empty as they were back then, so here you go. And there you go, that's the same view these days. And Dogford Wood is probably even older than the, uh, the 17th century. We have records of it from the 1200s. Uh, in fact, that name is a, I can, I can go into a rant about uh, folk etymology, which is a, a thing in itself, but uh, Dog Ford, I always looked at that and I was so confused. There's, there's no water body for miles. And what's a dog got to do with a Ford? And it turns out it's corruption over time. When we have these old English place names that mean nothing to us, we think of what it sounds similar to. Um, so you might think of Glasgow, in a few years, no one knows what a go is, so it might be the glass cow in a few hundred years, sort of like that. So this was Dock Ferd, meaning the, the forest where dock leaves grew. But over time, people thought it sounded like a dog ford. And here, this little lane is Red Bridge Lane. It's not a bridge, and it's not red, and there's nothing about it. <laughs> it's a dingy little lane. <laughs> um, but that's because this field right next to it was called Red Beach Lane. It was the beach where the, where the red beaches grew, or the reedy beaches grew. Um, but there you at some point, there were no beaches there, so they didn't think that it made sense to call it Red Breach, so they decided to call it Red Bridge, which makes uh, no sense. <laughs> Surprisingly good, isn't it? Yes. For <laughs> oh, sorry, the OS map, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, this is, this is surprisingly good, yes. This would have been done, this would have been, um, what's it called? This would have been paid for uh, to, to have this small area surveyed. You have really awful maps from this period as well where, uh, for example, money prizes were given out for the first person who could uh, ca uh, map a whole county, and they're, they're just horrific. They're unusable. But there you go. Now on to the local brick kiln industry, um, which I only knew, found out about earlier this year, really. Um, so these red dots are all former kilns. Um, the first kilns were probably active around the 1500s. Um, and they were active until the 1930s. This was the last one to shut, and it shut around the 1930s. And in fact, the Watercress line transported, I was told this the other day, the, tr the Watercress trans uh, transported bricks as well, because uh, this was apparently an active brick-making industry. But it had its real uh, boom in the 1600s and 1700s, where bricks like this, I know, very appetizing. This one's burnt, so ignore that one. And this, this one's broken, and so is this one. <laughs> I've yet to find a whole one. Let me know if you find one. Um, where these were made. So that we have a, a really rich clay, clay soil over here, um, and we have clay pits absolutely everywhere. So if you ever find a big pit on your walk, that's usually, it's, it's usually a clay pit. Especially in this Welling Hill Pond, if you've ever been there on a walk, you'll notice how tumultuous the landscape is, you'll notice how bumpy and lumpy everything is, and that's because these were clay pits and so much clay was extracted out of the soil there, um, and the kilns were just around the, the, the circumference. In fact, these are from Swelling Hill, around the pond there. So yes. And then the windmills. So we have our first record of a windmill in the 1400s and a later one here in the 1500s. This, this says Mill Furlong, believe me. Um, these windmills um, 
were quite numerous. We have around four or five that we know of, which uh, again, like I say, were first recorded in the 1400s um, and then lasted up until the, I think, early 1800s. There's one, in fact, this one was the last one. Um, these windmills uh, were put here because obviously we need mills to, to grind corn and to make flour and so on, but with no water source, with no spring, with no river in the uh, immediate area, the only source of power or consistent source of power was wind. So windmills were the go-to uh, mill of the area. So this one was near, uh, was south of Petersfield Road. Um, I, I think it's Myrtle Farm, south of Myrtle Farm now. That one was far gone, uh, I think the last time it's recorded is the, the late 1500s, so this one was a very early one. This is a very nice advert from the late 1700s of a windmill just opposite Travelodge in Formarks, if anyone's ever been there. There's a big field there, big empty field. That's where there was a windmill up until uh, the early 1800s. This is a windmill just outside of Ropley. This one I've done a bit of research about. And uh, then we have the old windmill stones. So the windmill inn in Formarks was uh, an establishment until I believe very recently actually, uh, I think 10, 12 years ago it shut down and was replaced by the co-op. But uh, it, was a, uh, it was an inn for a very long time and before that, even, even look at this, this map is from the 1750s, even then it was known as the old windmill. Um, shows its age. So probably in around the 1600s it had its head in. <coughs> so there we go. Now, um, a bit of change of flavour. I finished with the archaeology segment, or at least the, uh, the telling you about archaeology segment. Now I'm here to ask you. Um, we've been throwing this idea around for a bit, or I have mostly with myself, um, about the Rockley Big Dig. So every year there's a uh, festival of archaeology and uh, local archaeology groups tend to do uh, big digs. Now these big digs aren't that big actually, they're just small village digs. Two years ago we had one in Alton, uh, this year there was one in Petersfield which I missed unfortunately. Um, and I was thinking, I've been speaking to Lis Archaeology, they're a local archaeology group, and I've been speaking with them about the possibility of maybe doing a Rockley big dig. They love the idea, they say if there's volunteers for it, if there's people who want to have the back garden, don't worry, very nicely <laughs> dug up and cleaned up and Guard, intensive gardening, I like to call it. Um, if there's any volunteers, then they're more than happy to think about it. Not for next year, possibly the year after that. We'll see about putting a firm date on it for now. But look, Ropley is dense with history and archaeology, as you can just see from this very brief, and I'm being incredibly brief and superficial. I could go on for hours, but I, I, uh, I value your sanity. Um, but Ropley is really dense with history and archaeology. Hopefully there's eager and interested locals. I see some people nodding off, but most of you seem to be awake. <laughs> And there has unfortunately been very little that has been researched and excavated. Uh, we've had the odd uh, excavation before uh, a pipe's been put in or a house has been built, or we've had the odd research excavation or the odd field walk or detectorist like myself, but uh, there's been very little proper research and there's so much potential, especially from the Stone Age. So is there perhaps the possibility of a community excavation here? But either way, that's a tangent and uh, I'd like to thank you so much for, for listening and uh, that ends the first part of the uh, thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manny. I think we'll have to invite him back. He's <laughs> obviously a fountain of knowledge and information there. Um, are there any questions? If so, hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Did you see that on the Week and Wonder site? I did, yes. So you know you said it was an angel. Mm. Half noble, I guess. I'm very sorry, I'm not a numismatist. I'm very yeah. sorry. It's okay. I saw, I saw it was crushed, but he did a good job of he did a good job of rejoining it, yeah. That's right, it's amazing. Yeah. I think I wasn't found too far away from here, was it? No, near the railway bridge on the left. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. If I didn't find it, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's all I mean. I have a question. Um, mm. Housing development is always a, a threat in a rural village. Mm. Clearly, if, if organisations are doing huge big developments, like in London, mm. they have to stop and let archaeologists go in that's and right, see yeah. what goes on the site, if, if yeah. anything. Does the same apply if something is bumped into? Um, you know, so say someone's developing mm. a house here mm. on, a, on a greenfield or brown. Yeah. Site, and they suddenly find that they're, you know, ploughing in and going, oh, that might be, you know, tiles or sure. whatever. Are they 
obligated to stop and notify the local authorities? I'm afraid I'm, I'm not familiar with the law. You do have supervisional archaeologists. They tend to be there when pipes are put in, yeah, and they just, okay. they just watch, basically, and then they make notes if there's been anything that's found. Um, I'm not sure on the law on that, but I, I mean, you should. You really should. If yeah. you find anything at all, um, you re register it. Okay, thank you. Yes. How I date my phones. So, um, gosh, very good question. Uh, <laughs> the internet, primarily. <laughs> no, uh, there's, there's ways. Uh, so if, when it comes to flint, there's ways of looking at the size, the type, what it is. Um, there's certain features on it, which you can date from that. So if it's a small blade, for example, that's had a little bit of retouch, it might be Mesolithic. Uh, if it's a larger piece and it's been very clunkily made, it might be later Neolithic. Um, you have different forms, basically, if you can imagine. You have all these different types of tools of what it could be, and then you basically just compare your finds to these types, and you say, well, it's most likely to be a sickle, and you can, with enough experience, you can say quite, quite concretely, oh, this is a scraper, for example, and but looking at the scraping, uh, sorry, looking at the retouch, the way it's been made, looking at the material, looking at the size, it's Mesolithic, for example. But with other finds, pottery, for example, you have catalogues and so on where you can compare, and the internet is the way to go these days, mostly. <laughs> Uh, Rocky Talk Batter Hampshire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hadn't thought about it, but uh, <laughs> do we want to fall out of Cornwall? Yeah. <laughs> Invade Cornwall, no. Um, I have I been in. I don't even think Cornwall know why they've got it. So I, I've, emailed the, I've emailed the museum, so it was bought in 1925. It's been in their collection since then. Um, and basically, they, they just own it because they bought it. Um, you get that with so many archaeological finds. Um, I mean. Is, it would have, it would have been nice, wouldn't it? But I think I think the permanence of it being there is, yeah, it's very expensive, <laughs> especially these days. No, but I think the centenary. That's true. Yes, actually, that's a good, very good point. Eighteen forty-five. Yeah, bicentenary. Actually, yeah. Wait another twenty years. Twenty-two. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned a few times that there's very little water in the area. Yes. So why is the rock there? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Well, that question would be better as why is four marks there? So Rockley just about has enough water access uh, to, to, to make sense of this. We have a lot of ponds here, so pond access and well access would have been what, what fed that. But four marks, um, that's, that's the main clincher of why four marks didn't exist for a long time and why four marks really doesn't exist until the 1930s. Um, and there's only really two farms, three farms uh, before then because there was no water. I mean, four marks, if you've ever driven over, it's literally just a ridge. And if you got rid of the houses, then it's just BP on a ridge, and that's as good as the desert. Um, so yeah, that's why that is. And I can back that because I'm right into the north. Yeah. Um, and we were, our, our crew is quite terrible. Yeah, there you go. No water. And the soil isn't very good either. Soil. Yeah. So that which is why, if there's no good soil, if there's no water, why the hell would you want to go there? So that's why there's no medieval village in Four Marks, for example. But there is in Rockley. Oh yeah. The name? Yeah. So it's the, 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 the boundaries of four parishes. So it's the Marks. Mark is an old name for boundary. Uh, we get that in Markton, Markham, all those places. Um, and that was the parishes of uh, Ropley, Farringdon, East Histead. No, excuse me. Ropley, Farringdon, Mesdead, and Shorten. Yeah. And another one at the back. And then yes. Yeah, you, you can get that a lot. Uh, I've had a few, uh, I think there was a coincidence near Humphrey, I believe. Uh, I think one of your neighbouring houses is called Heldens, which I think, I think was just made up. But uh, on a field name, it's actually a very, very old field name, and it's actually Ang Anglo-Saxon, and I think that's a neighbouring field, and I think it's just a coincidence that they picked the name, because it doesn't seem to be right next to the field. But yes, so, so yes, you can have it, but it depends. Are there any places around here which are like not actually that old? Monk, Monkwood is first recorded in the 1500s. Uh, it's, it's also a bit of a weird one. Um, it seems to probably, so there's a few theories in that. They're all my theory, because I'm the only person who's bothered with it. <laughs> it's either the woodland that belongs to the monk, or the woodland where the monk lives, or the woodland which is owned by a, a priory. 
and I, I haven't been able to come to the bottom of it. What I think it's most likely is it was probably owned by Selborne Priory, um, but there's very few records of it um, prior, well, there's no records of it prior to the 1550s, um, and it doesn't seem to appear in anything relating to Selborne Priory. But there is a monk who lived in, form, uh, in Rockley in the 1300s, William the Monk. Um, so he might have lived there, but I don't know. <laughs> yes? Um, Danny, following on from an earlier question, no worries. when were wells first dug? Uh, ever? Well, no, in, around here. Do you uh, I'm not very sure. I, I have no knowledge on that. I know we there haven't. There are a lot of water. Yes. Lot of wells, yes. The water, the main water came from Rockley in 1948. Yeah. 1500. Um, no, I'm not sure. I mean, wells exist, uh, I think, since the Neolithic. We have w wells in the Stone Age, but um, I'm not sure in Rockley. Again, it needs to be dug if anyone wants a well dug. Can I endorse Lewis archaeology? Yes, of course, yeah. Because um, I farm in Colmore, and oh, I've yeah. been digging on my oh. farm. For the oh, that's last your farm, is it? Years, I was about to look. And it's been incredibly mm -hmm. exciting, um, and we've found a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And they are really so professional mm -hmm. and so enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't recommend them coming yeah. to Rockley Moor. No, Lys, Lys really are a professional group. They really are a, a brilliant group, um, and especially what they do in Colmore. Very That's, yeah. uh, in fact, I'll be digging on your farm later this year, if, if you don't mind. <laughs> 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 I will be, yes. Oh, yes, that's right, this one's here. You're right, you're right. Thank you very much. Any yes. more questions? Humphrey. I'm surprised that the aerial photographs show evidence of a settlement going back to the Stone Age? Mm, uh, no, uh, the earliest is Iron Age. Iron Age. What were the Iron Age people doing to the perimeters of their settlements to make them last so long? Because they were all <laughs> Digging very, very deep ditches uh, is, is, is how you get crop marks. Or did you put the stones in? Or no, no, so uh, again, you just have this such a deep ditch that it might even cut into the bedrock. And then that fills in with uh, fertile humus, which allows uh, soil, uh, which allows the roots of crops to uh, penetrate more deeply and develop more fruitfully, so you get a better crop. So basically, it's just depth of fertile soil, which is all crop marks are. Right. So, yes. No worries. Yes. Um, can you show us a map of Fineton Protectorate? That's right, yes. And I wondered whether how that related to the current map of Rock. <laughs> so that's a very, uh, very clever way of question. No, uh, th there are certain areas, yes. Um, but with the with that map, for example, that was just that just so happens to be where detectors have gone. And in fact, it's the Weekend Wanderers, of which a member is here. Um, the Weekend Wanderers are a, a, a prolific group. They go primarily on manor farms fields. So that's to the northeast of the parish. Um, those big swathing fields either side of you when you drive up the A31 towards Formox. Those fields, they, there are a lot in there, so there's a lot of everything in there because they've been so prolific over 12 years. I think they've been on those fields, they've been down there for a while. So that causes an artificial looking exactly. If, yeah, if you're going to look a lot in an area, then you get an, an artificial spike of activity over there. Yeah, and does, it, does it work better if you've got deeper soil? Uh, for what finding things, finding things. oh, in general, uh. Uh, n no, no, it doesn't help if you have deeper, as in, if, if, as in less bedrock. Yes. Oh, yes, I suppose, yes. Quite low, oh, yes. So there seems little point. Yes, I suppose, yes, loose, so loose finds. But, you, I mean, <laughs> you might have feature finds, so features like post holes, pits, ditches, and so on. That, that, that could be fine and preserved, but individual finds, maybe not so much. Yes. Yes, one James. One, I think, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, well, they, all roads lead to Rockley, as they say. Uh, no. Um, so yes, so uh, almost all the finds there, uh, with, the, with the exception of the small pot shards, because they're not interested with that, are recorded with the Portable Antiquity Scheme, which is a scheme run by the British Museum, where you uh, take them to a finds liaison. So all these big words, you take them to a bloke, he puts them on the internet and he tells you what they are, <laughs> to, to cut a long story short. Um, and I gave him this, but I thought it was medieval hand originally, and he said, no, actually, it's a Roman amphora handle, and it's a type, the, the, there's types with everything in archaeology, so it's a type rod rib type three, for example. Um, and I did some more research on that and the form and the type, and I ended up reading this, the, this article about it. They come most likely from Spain, this ware, um, and then the wine would have been filled in there and then imported to the UK. 
Um, I'm not sure which port it might have been. I'm not familiar with my trade routes for that, but it would have possibly either come from London or Winchester. Rockley's right between the two, uh, possibly from Winchester. Um, exactly, and then would have been imported by a local, either Roman uh, or of Roman origin, uh, rich bloke, <laughs> or a, a high-ranking local Briton who wants to Romanize himself and wants to admire Roman culture so that he might buy Roman wine and might use Roman currency and Roman clothing because he wants to look all fancy and nice. Like we have trends today. The trend back then for some local rich blokes was to, uh, to be Roman, basically. So... <laughs> just about worn you out. So, <laughs> Thank you. So just run out of questions, I think. So could I ask you to just show your appreciation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.